Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to this lunchtime series, uh, which launches the stories about sustainability um, lectures for this autumn term. The series invites architects from around the world to look back to the materiality and craft of the past and see how it can inform more sustainable building practices now and in the future. Um, I'm Mani Verghese, I'm the head of public engagement at the AA, and I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Mario Cuccinella, founder of Mario Cuccinella Architects, as well as the School of Sustainability in Bologna, Italy. As a longtime collaborator with the Sustainable um, Envi Environmental Design Program here at the AA, we were excited to host his exhibition that's currently on show in the AA Gallery, um, and which is titled The Future is a Journey to the Past, Stories about Sustainability, which is where the title of this series draws its inspiration from. So it's only fitting that he gives the first lecture today, where he'll talk about both the exhibition and his recent publication of the same name to tell us more about the journeys described in the book that subsequently inspired the timeline in the gallery and have influenced his architectural practice today. His presentation will be followed by a conversation with Clara Oloriz San Juan, co-director of the AA Ground Lab. So before I hand over to Mario, a few um, logistical points. Um, following Mario's talk and Clara's response, we'll open up the conversation for a wider discussion. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat at any point, and we can either ask it on your behalf, or if you'd like to ask it yourself, just use the raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and uh, we can unmute you so you can ask it yourself. Um, also, since we decided to hold this series online in the name of sustainability, but also to enable global participation, if you feel comfortable to do so, it'd be great if you could turn your camera on during the discussion so we can all feel like we're in the same space. So um, I'm going to post a link in the chat um, for the uh, to, uh, to enable you to buy the book from the A Bookshop if you're interested. But without any further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Mario. Hi. Thank you, Marie-J. Thank you. I'm very happy to share with you this moment, this presentation, which I share with you now. So I, I will start this, uh, this presentation for a few key words from uh, our office, just to also understand the, the philosophy of the office, and of course, related to the theme of sustainability, and then make this kind of a journey in the past to see what what we are learning and what will be interesting to know about that for uh, future solutions and then some, some projects. So I think the first is about try to define this world, imagine a world where beauty is so full and sustainable. And I think that's introducing the idea that we need to find an aesthetic for sustainability. And maybe this aesthetic is not only aesthetic in some form, but maybe it's about the continents. So what the building tell us and which kind of relations is creating with the, the environment. You know? So about us a little bit. So we, we, we are working for so many years now and uh, we try, like we say, design for life and you design for beauty. You know? And I think I always tell to myself that then we design building for the others. We design school for other people. We design museum for people, no? not only for ourselves. And I think the research for an architect of an office is really to combine this idea to design for the others and at the same time try to find design, design for beauty. But what, what architects, uh, because as a student, I, I like to, to say what is the evolution of being an architect. No? So we are explorers and interpreters. You know, we need to explore the world. We need to understand better this relation between people and buildings. You know, we need to also be the interpreter of our time. You know? And time is always different, you know? because what was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or 1,000 years ago is a different time. So we need to be able to make an interpretation of our time. And then at the same time, we do research, but also we need to tell stories. No? Building is also about storytelling. No? We need to uh, tell which kind of relation this building creating with people, with the environment, with climate. So it's part of the work to tell stories about our design. And at the same time, we are analysts and artisans. So we, we, are, we are in an area between you know, all digitals and before was all by hand or so artisan. So I, I like then the office now is mature enough, I'm saying our time, 
to combining these two things, the analyst, so capacity to analyze things and use the digital world, but at the same time, I, I still think in and do things by hand. It's very important for an artist that you need to fill in the material, the space. And when you make your models or you make your prototype, is a is a learning experience. It's not only to make things. You know? And say the question of what, what's happened when architects embrace all this calling, you know? So I, I, I think it's time for us not only to give answers, but, but start to make a new question. You know? And the question is, of course, uh, we are not resolving the problem of sustainability of our energy, the social impact in cities. So it's time for question more than, than answer. So that's, and I feel very comfortable to, make a question to myself or, or the office asking ourselves what will be the solution we need to find it. Huh? And that's the value. No? Uh, I think we, we make an interpretation of what sustainability means for us, which is many things and sometimes too many. But I, I like the idea that sustainability is maybe this definition of creative empathy. No? It's, it's two words for me very important, you know, creativity and empathy. Empathy is the attitude that you have with people, with, with place, with climate. So you need to make an effort to understand what is around you. And creativity, of course, is one of the fundamental parts of our work. But creativity can be also extravaganza. You, know? you need to be careful how to use the power of creativity. So combining empathy and creativity, you may be managing the creativity as a result of this kind of uh, empathy with, with things around you. And design, of course, sustainability is not only a performance. Performance is important, of course, but, but there are many angles you know, where we look at sustainability and then can we go for the social impact, for materials, performance and energy. So. I think it's difficult to define what sustainability means exactly. You know? I think it's also sustainability is something which is defined in a different way in different parts of the planet. You know? So what is sustainability for us in Italy is maybe very different for sustainability in, in some other part of Africa or United States or South America. And I think it is a, it's a local definition. It's not a global definition. It's a global problem but you need to target what is your major problem in your area. You know? And I think that's expressed also the idea that sustainability is an ecosystem. So different answer to the same question. And also, which is more difficult to, <laughs> to answer to this question, what, what's the beauty of our time? What, what, what meaning beauty, you know? And, uh, and I like it starting from the beginning, the beauty, Maybe it's, you know, it's a concept of change in time. You know? What was we call beauty in 30 years ago, maybe we look now, it it's, doesn't look beauty anymore. And I, I like the idea that beauty for our time is something also invisible. You know? It's what is inside of a building, how the buildings work, what is impacted with people. So it's not only an aesthetic point of view, it's, it's a vision much more larger. You know? and lead the way with open arms. I, I think for, for us in the last, uh, as an architect, but in the last years, or maybe for was like this also many years ago, we need to be open to other knowledge. You know? Architecture should be not something focused only on the way you design, but get the, open your mind to many other disciplines, know about many other things, because the architecture in the end is a synthesis, no? it's an interpretation of our time, and you need to know many things. No? And I think that is the most exciting part of the work. It's not only about how you detail in your buildings or how you make the shape and your interpretation, it's make building because you know more things no? from biology, ecology, anthropology, and, and I think that's helped to give a, a sort of a continent of the beauty. You know? And also be brave and honest, you know, adventures. I, I, I like the idea of the word honest, you know, because of course we are all, all honest, but honest for me or is, you know, is to, when we talk about buildings and sustainability, we, be, we, we need to be honest about 
where we are in the moment. So we are not yet at the point of sustainability. We are, we are not yet there. We make our progress. We make effort to make better, but we are not zero. That, that this idea of zero is doesn't exist. So I like the idea that we are honest enough to say ourselves where we are. So we maybe improving from the past. We miss better building, but we still have a lot of things to do. No? And I, I like the fact that we tell between us honestly where the point, where we are in the situation at the moment. No? And of course, sustainability is more than function and features. No? It's, this is much more wide vision. No? I think we, we must know also that I think the exhibition in the exhibition area tell quite clearly sustainability is a very modern world because we discover we are unsustainable. So we, we, we make this idea of sustainability, try to find a way to solve that problem. But in the history, this, this problem doesn't exist because, because you see in the exhibition, we always try to find a good relationship and empathy both with the energy and material, material available. We never waste anything. You know, we start to waste in the last 250 years. So we need to redefine what sustainability means because it's a nice world. And we are only this world to express what sustainability means. No? And I think that's why this book about the future is a journey in the past that tell you that we need to we need to look back. We need to look back. So just for a little very short introduction about the global challenges. No, the story of climate change, starting with Rio de Janeiro '92, is a UN conference. So it's the first time the whole nation they are together to talk about the climate change. You know? And then every year is a conference about climate change. So next one in November is uh, in Egypt. And, uh, but from there, there will happen many things, no? So that's why today the time is mature because in the last 30 years, there were so many things happened, no? COP15 in Copenhagen, the, the, the German uh, passive house standard, the zero new residential building in the UK, the Francis Pope, Pope Francis encyclical allowed that to see. So there are many events, you know, many, many, many things happened around us in the last 30 years, you know, then, then creating this idea that we need to go forward, you know, sustainability, the Friday for Futures. No, and then the, the agenda 2030, 2050, you know, so how we can reduce CO2 emission, you know, 40% in Germany, 34 in the UK, 2020 was 20% in, in Euro, which is already gone. How we can design low and zero carbon standard in Europe, and then more ambition 2040, 2050, you know, how we can reduce in 80%. 50% the, the uh, CO2 emissions and, and uh, arrive to zero carbon, uh, uh, zero carbon in Europe. So it's a very ambitious agenda, very ambitious. So I think there's a lot of work. And I think we, this, in this moment, we need a lot of creativity, not, not only technology, but we need an interpretation of how we do, how we design our city, how we design better buildings. So, so it's a huge amount of work to do. Then just an information that we know building construction account for more than 35% of global finance and energy use and nearly 40% of energy related CO2 emissions. So I think building cities are really the, the, the major problem that we need to solve. That's why the European roadmap is focused on the quality of the cities, how we can live better in our city, you know, reducing traffic, reducing pollution increasing public transport. So that there are many actions in, in one way to reduce the impact of ourselves on, on, the, on the planet. On the other hand, how we can live better in our planet, how we can live better in our city. You know? So I think that is, is the two main goals. You know? yeah. But just to tell you something, and then we'll go in details on the project. But, so we are concentrating in the last uh, years about the performance of the building, you know, which is, was a very good. So we now we can design a building with very low energy need. But if you look at that diagram, it's the life of a building in 30 years. 
So you can see this diagram that 47% of CO2 emission during the life of the building was made by the production of material no? and then the construction. So this phase is, is almost equivalent of the operational of 30 years of a building. So we are very focused, we are we was very focused on performance, and now the point is to be focused on the new generation of material and material with very low impact in terms of the CO2 emission. So it can be the new generation is still concrete, like 30% less CO2, is a new uh, steel. Uh, which is coming from recycling, aluminum. So th they are starting now to using ma traditional material, but with different process of production. But this is the key point, you know, combining performance with material. And then, of course, what will be the aesthetic of all this? You know? And that is a little bit a paradox of the story, no? The CO2 emissions grow, still growing. There's no any signs of reduction. Then European on 2022, I mean this year, they start to make a law for public buildings to build building to near nearly zero energy, which is mean the energy you need need to be from renewable energy, which is mean it's all about technology problem, is the design of your building, how you design building with these specific uh, definitions. At the same time, the second curve is the increasing of population in the world. So it's a demand of billions of square meters everywhere. And at the same time, we want to reduce in the emissions. So the gap between the increasing population and demand of buildings and the ambition to reduce the gap, that is the problem. And I think it's an empty and huge area of work where we can improve in reducing this gap. So back in the history, so why we talk about this? So this is the panel of the exhibition showing from the past, you know, there's some examples from the past, how people was able to deal with the climate with no energy, you no? Know? It started from a pretty long time. And then we write this book called The Future is a Journey to the Past, 10th Story of Architecture. But the, the idea of this, was uh, make a, a journey from the north of uh, Ireland to the China, so crossing the east, not to east. I did visit in many of these places. Some I missing, but the COVID was for me impossible to make this trip, and I and instead uh, to do it, I'm writing that book. So I I write the journey. You know? And then for me, it was important because I think an example from not only from the past, but for an architect, it's very important to see the buildings. You can watch many pictures, you can watch in video, but I think then you can learn a lot if you go to visit a building, feeling space, feeling materials, feeling the context of the building. So it was a long story for architects make a journey, you know, it's from Le Corbusier to Darwando. They all went around the world to study buildings because you need to see buildings. You need to see. You need to see the cities. You need to see the place. See how people use the building. So that's when I'm encouraging you to do it. So the, the, I tell you some of the stories. The first one is, is a very interesting story. They call the garden that was not there before. So we talk about garnish. So this is um, a panel, if you go to this, sorry, it's go too fast. The blue pool ferry to Gang China, subtropical garden, but it's not in a tropical uh, latitude. It's here in the fjord of Cork, province of Cork on the west of Ireland. No? And the island is just the island in the middle of the picture. No? And then it was an island uh, very, in the climate in that area is, particularly because it's very windy. It's the wind comes from the sea, from the Atlantic Sea. But in the same time, it's a mild because it's come from the Mexico Gulf. You know? it's, a, it's a mild, mild wind. You know? But because it was too windy on the island, there was no way for tree to grow. The wind is too strong. So this uh, Peto was a landscape architect with his general. So they, he bought the island and decided to transform the island because he was navigating around the world, bringing a lot of species. And then 
So the design of this was the beginning was an hospital land. Then the landscape architect he started to put bushes around to you know change the direction of the wind you know, and and choice in, make a choice of plants that can deal with the salt water. No, sorry, he made this sort of a belt around the island. So the strong wind is just moving high and then give the chance for the small tree to grow enough to be able to be, go against the wind. So, and then the, the tree is growing quite fast. I'm saying they need at least 30 years project. It's not something you can do in a few years, so waiting for the buildings grow, from the trees grow. And then, you know, it's moving the wind in a different direction, you know? And then create an area where the two elements was the temperature and humidity was the earth of this island, you know? And then in the middle of the island is a tropical garden. So if you look at the picture, now it's a little bit chaotic because this is the bushes around, you know? This is a tree under a year later, you know? You see the little hands. And then what's happening inside of a garden? So there are thousands of species of, of tropical plants and flower. So that showing for me was an extra, it's a beautiful place to go to visit because you need to take a little ferry, go between island and arrive in this place and then discover these natures. And then inside is the flowers from many subtropical area. You know? and then they try to make an Italian garden, but, uh, you know, Italy is a very different climate and they can't because then the nature was going great too fast and then it's, you know, occupied all this area, but it's quite beautiful creatures. So just to tell you then, you, 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 we can modify the nature, not always to destroy nature, we can also improve in quality, you know. And I think this is an example of how design is so important, you know, how you, we can design things that can make a better place you know, with that kind of conditions. And then there's another story, very funny story from uh, Villa, is a feast of Galileo Galilei, which is an astronomer. And he tells a story, funny story, he, he went for a party, so we are in the Renaissance period, and then it was very hot in this in his biography. He said, oh, it was a very beautiful party with a lot of food and we were drinking a lot, it was too hot. You know? And we tried to find a place, a cooler, a cooler place. You know? And then they went to the first floor of the villa and they find it a grill on the floor where the air, fresh air come out. You know? So then if you look in the, the sketch, this is the way the villa is built. It's, attached to the hills and behind the hill is a called Covoli, it's a sort of a, a cave, you know? And then inside the cave, the, the, the air is cooler and humid, so it is heavy and, and then the air goes down and then back to the villa and then the villa was cooled by the system. You know? That's the grill on the floor, you know, it's a beautiful design, you know? and uh, very well integrated with the style of Palladium style villa. No? That is a villa. No? I look in that, I, I look in this picture and say, uh, it's, not an, it's not a sustainable aesthetic. Now this is the aesthetic of that time, but you know, it's the way they people thinking how to create this relationship between buildings and comfort. No? That's, that's the key points. No? And uh, another, this place I've been to visit was fantastic, you know, and we, we are in Morocco after the Atlantic uh, mountains, you know, and then, uh, sorry, oops, sorry, it's a city built with the uh, hurt, you know? and it's, it's a beautiful, I mean, there are many examples, you know? And then many countries, also in Italy and many other kind of European countries, or Africa, or South America, Australia, you know, in the past, we built with the material available, in that case, was hurt. You know? But then I like the beauty between the natures and the design, the, rational, the rationality of make buildings, you know, but with the same material of the rocks and, and the plane. You know? 
and and we was inspired by this. And also, if you if you go in this village, it, it's very difficult to design to draw. It's very difficult because you see all these towers, but the city is you walking under this building. It's sort of a under shade, and it's a very complicated map. So the, the, the way they think, you know, was to, to be always under the shade, inside of buildings, and then the air moving inside of the modern buildings and the cooler place is amazing. And we, we was inspiring by this to make this, and I can tell you later, you now as 3D printer house in, in, uh, in Quintos to Bologna. And then if you go to see the invisible city, you no. Know, and maybe you remember the episode four of Star Wars, you no? Know, and and Luke Skywalker come back home, you no? Know, and then it's Luke's family, you know, a long, long time ago in a galaxy. You know, and that house, you no, know, from another galaxy, you know, galaxy was the house of Skywalker. You know? And that what well, there's an existing, it's, it's true, you no? Know, this is a Mar- is in Matmata in Tunisia. And it was a village built in the desert underground, no, because the, the ground is also always at the same temperature, no, between 70, 18 degrees, maybe outside there are 55, 50 degrees. So you can live in a cool area, no, in cool rooms and open to this, this sort of a square or garden, depending where you visit in this place, no. That is a little diagram, no? They have an open air. The Chinese make beautiful place and they show. And, and then you can live in this room. Of course, the level of comfort is not what we think in this comfort today. But the, the way the, the interpretation of a context is very difficult. They make people thinking how we can design building in that context for better life. No? That's, that's the principle. No? That's the China. It's the same thing, you no? Know? I, I, I love this picture because it looks like a master plan, but there's no buildings, you no. Know? And I'm sure in the summertime, the trees cover everything. You don't really see the city. The city is all underground and connecting between. And, and, and then I find that's really, really respecting for all the place. And of course, this was made because the rocks were easy to crave, yeah, to... Excavating and the difference between the Chinese and the and the Tunisian. The Tunisian shape is a very organic, and Chinese houses are very straight, very square, no? And then maybe for different tools, maybe different kind of material, different culture. No? And this is an amazing thing. So this is a little design in uh, Cappadocia no? for escaping for from Islam, you know, the Christian Christian. In, in, uh, in that time, they, they designed and built a city underground and it's 80 meters deep on the ground and then an incredible system of ventilation. So they're cooking, they're living, they're animals. But if you go in, you're lost in a second. So I've been there and it was light. But if it's not light, it's impossible to find a way to go out. So it's a sort of a defined place. And this is really a city, you know, it's, it's an incredible experience. You know? Now you can see from here, you don't see anything, but it's all underground. And there's another one in Australia was built for the period where they're looking for gold. And then, then the extreme climate of that area, desert of Australia, they really built another horizontal, immense city underground. So I, I like them we exploring underground buildings. Now, this is just a picture of a museum we did underground using stones. And I, I like to have a reference, you know, it's a different things, but design building underground is different. And another one, and uh, is, is, a, is a very, very interesting uh, story about hospitals, uh, hospitalities was actually, you know, Bimaristan is built in uh, Aleppo, in uh, Jordania, in Syria, sorry, in Syria. And it was built, uh, yeah, it was a medieval time, you know? And, and the, 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 this place was designed to be like this. It's a, normally, it's a courtyard, four courtyards, 
uh, with the portico arcade all around. And the way to cure people is about the shading, the fresh air ventilation, and the uh, water, clean water, and the good food. That was the principle how to make an hospital. No? And you can see in that picture. So. And then it was a series of courtyard portico. So the people well-being was really built by the way you designed the buildings. Of course, and then it was the medical things, but the fundamental it means you design an hospital, the major element of an hospital is the well-being inside of the space. No? And, and this was another one you can find in the book is, is uh, we are in, um, in uh, I don't remember the place, sorry, Al-Balad in Jeddah. And it is, we are in, I mean, in Saudi Arabia and then it's so incredible place. Sorry, I don't know why it's not so fast. It's, a, it's an invisible city because of course it's a culture not to see people behind the windows, but also the incredible system of, of shading of this building, you know, creating a, a partner of all the facade, you know? and this mainly for ventilation and for private. You know? and, uh, and then I mean, pictures are not very really good to see, but you must see the, in, the aesthetic of this village you know, with all this grill and the effectiveness of the shading, you know? especially in, in places where the sun is very high, so it's a vertical. You know? And then the last story is about a Marco Polo uh, trip, a journey back from China. It's a very long, long sailing from the South China Sea to Arabian Sea. And then he landed in Ormuz, you know, which is between, the, it was the Persia, or today is Iran. And from there, he went to Constantinople, you know, Istanbul. And then he's when he was in this desert, the people in the desert offered to him a faludesh, the frozen ice cream from the desert. No? And you can imagine how the Persian people in that context, no, they was able to make ice. No? And, and they was able to make ice because they make a building. No? And uh, the building is this one, it's a section, it's a very high wall. And the wall was long, almost 100 meters. No? And behind the wall is a very shallow pool. No? And then in front of the wall is a, is a tank with a, a dome. No? And what's happening in the night, in the winter time, you know, they're putting a very shallow water, so really one centimeter, it's very, very low. And for the effect of the sky, which is minus 50, minus 55, is take away the eating from the water and frozen the water. So night after night, they fill the tank. And then when they start to be full, it's the ice is icing everything around and they keep the ice for all the summer. And the dome with the natural ventilation during the summer, take away the eating from the day you know, and creating a sort of a protection for the eye. So what I mean is, this, this was done in uh, 1,271, so we talk about 800, 800 years ago. And maybe the Persian people, they maybe take hundreds of years to understand how things happen. You know, it was very, what we call it, empiric innovation. They tried, tried, they made it, and they designed the building. You know? So I like the idea when they talk about the creative empathy. This is the creative empathy. You know, how we can design a building to be able to make ice in the middle of the desert. You know? So and I mean, we don't need to do again, of course. <laughs> That's not the point. You know? The point is the way people thinking. You know? So now we talk about the climate adaptation. You know? We talk about this, the climate change and how we can adapt our building to climate. So I think we need to rethink it like this. You know? It's not about technology. Technology is a safe area, but technology is not enough. No, it's the way you design your building. So, so and then after night, they accumulate in ice and then keeping cool during the summertime. You know? So I, I, that's the size of the tank. You see the little man. So you can imagine the size of the, this place, the size of a block of ice. So it's almost an impossible thinking today, you know? 
and then we was able to do it. So I'm, I'm always surprised when we see problems because I think in the past we're solving something that today we are unable to do it. And we have many technology and things. So uh, I, we are the same human being. And we are the same almost a thousand years ago. We're still homo sapiens. So, and I have full trust that a human are able to do that again. No? So that's the aesthetic of, of this of this dome. No? No, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And the last one, because I want some time to show you my work, and uh, it's this beautiful building in uh, in uh, in uh, Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Oh, it was building designed by architects for Maraja. And all these buildings are, are building underground. Again, so they stand to build a palace over the ground. They're building down under the ground, and it was a palace. No? And then it's done like this, because every step you go, temperatures drop down, and the last piece is a well, when collecting water in the winter time or the rain season, and the people living on that building. No? And the building is an amazing place. Some is a sculpture, completely craved on the rocks, with a, an amazing quality. No? And, and uh, there are few still open as a public building. So yeah, I've been there to see that in Hamanabad. And then you can go there, it's people chatting or eating their sandwich or friends talking in the, in the you know, very, I don't say darkness, but it's less light and it's fresh, it's a cool. And I think the impact of this building on the social life of every day is amazing. You know, it's beautiful. You know, it's, and then you can see the level of decoration. So I, I, I find that very inspiring. No? But the story of this building is quite dramatic too, I see. No? There's a many examples you can see. This is a missing the roof in this building, but you can see, you still feel it if you go down, no? the temperature's dropping quite dramatically. No? And, and then the story was the best building was built by six architects. And then the manager, in terms of, uh, say, because they did so beautiful work, he killing the six architects, avoiding make another beautiful building. So you want to be the only one. And the tomb of these architects is outside the building. So I've been there to visiting just to give my respect for these professions so it can be sometimes very dangerous. The city of wind and is inspiring a lot. This is in Pakistan, so it is kind of a kite, you know, it's catch the wind and bring the wind, cold wind in the night, bring the inside of, of a building, you know? and at the same time shading the building, and, and then this kind of kite is open, bring air, cool air inside of the mass of the building. And during the day, you close everything and then keeping this cooling inside. So they did with energy available, and the only energy available was the cold wind of the night, and then design a building around this for the better comfort of people. And, and that picture is beautiful. So this is the aesthetic of sustainability. We cannot do that, you know, we can't do that. But I think it's kind of an extraordinary picture. So. And then we, we, we did this filing, we make a building, which I'll show very quickly after. In here, close to Bologna, is the headquarter of the Environmental Protection Agency in, in here. And we designed 120 chimneys to connect water, collecting air and ventilation. So the last one, I'm sorry to be too long, is the what we call the social housing or the community. You know? This is in Fujian, a beautiful com commune building. You know, there's a family, but it's a clan, it's a group of people living together. So of course, they also, the way to defend from outside invasion, but also is the sense of community. We are talking so much about community, we talk so much about participation, but we design building, they are not creating this kind of a connection. I think that was for me a, a very inspiring thing. You know? Okay, so the, 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 
the exhibition is to tell you about all the stories, no? And also connecting with different experiences. No? One is this in uh, Monte Verità, we are in Switzerland, close to Italy, and it was a, in 1920, a group of people decided to live in a uh, hill. And living in a college way, you know, like uh, using only natural fiber, cultivated their own food, and art, dance, and painting was part of their life, you know, dancing. So I thought it was an amazing experience in 19, 1920 when the Industrial Revolution was starting already for a few years. There's a community thought that the life is about art, it's about uh, living in peace with nature, living safe, you know, and, and it's quite amazing experience of that. And if you get a chance to reading about it, it, it very inspires, it's very modern, I'm saying. Then, so, there are different things on that guide in this uh, timeline. You know? And also, in, in the, the Joseph Boys is the artist, which is one of the founders of the Green Party in Germany, you know, in Documenta, 1982, you no. Know, he put his 7,000 pieces of basalt or the stones on, on the piazza and say, we only take away the stone if you plant a tree. And today, Castle is a forest, a little forest of Joseph Boss, was the sign to tell how much was important already at that time, you know, the relation with nature and how it was difficult. You know, it was a difficult thing to take away all the stone and every stone you planted trees. I think it was an actually interesting showing the, the art. Artists are very sensitive, you know? they, they always have a little step forward by, by their everyday life. You know? And I think this action was very, very interesting. And he made a lot of things about ecology, working in the countryside. So it was inspiring for that time. You know? And uh, we go on, and, and we are almost in the end of the timeline. And now I will show you some projects. I, I, I'm not sure if I have a little bit more time. Manny J? Yeah, if you, I think if you want to show a few projects, that's fine. Okay, just because, just to give you some example. This was a building we built in, in, in Ghana. No? And started always some little sketch, you know, because I, I think as an architect, after many years of work, you you, you sketch things that they are already part of your thought in terms of the environment. You know, for me, that little sketch was inspired by the trunk of the palm, but at the same time, I was looking for shadow. You know? And uh, I'll show you now. This is the sun part of that latitude. So you can see from May to December. Still, the, the sun is very high, and also it's very high also in the sunset or in the on the on the early morning. No? So that the picture is inspiring. You know, for part of the time in the subtropical area, temperature are quite good between 24, 25, 23. You know, and the sun is hot. But if you're under shade, air temperature is good. So if I design a building. Which is take can make shadows or be under shade. I don't need to cool in the building all the time. So that's why we designed this. This is a concrete building. Then it's an old floor cantilever. So the glass, the facade is three meters behind the columns, which is make this building also in the in the summertime. We are in June. You can see it. All the buildings under shade, which is mean I need less than half cooling for the building in the hot season. And I can use a glass, transparent glass, I can open the windows. No? So if you design this, and then is the, is the patio, you can see the louvers, the glass louvers. So I can open that and open windows and ventilate it. That's the reason for that. It's a comfort, of course, but also. Because electricity in Ghana is expensive, like in many other countries, because it is producing by oil, and oil costs the same everywhere. So, if you make this increasing ventilation, uh, shading the building, you can for, from the design, you're already improving the quality 
of the sustainability of the building because you're reducing the demand of energy. And then, of course, you can add some technology, but not for all the time. No? So that is the spirit of this project. No? Then is another one is a school we did for, for, uh, kids, again, for kids, uh, zero, three years. And it's very interesting, uh, this guy, Malaguzzi, is the founder of Regio Children, is the model of kindergarten around the world. And he's the architecture, he's the third educator. So that's given to architects the responsibility how to design schools, because school is a public school, private school, is the place where you welcome kids that the first time went out of home and they enter in a society, you know, in a public place with uh, new friends, new educators, different people, their families. So. And I was inspired by the story of Pinocchio, you know, that everybody knows the Pinocchio stories, but uh, this is the Pinocchio, Geppetto is, uh, Joseph is in the eaten by the whale and Pinocchio was lost in the way that they find each other. So it's a, it's a beautiful story if you have time to read. And then, for me, it was, the, it was an, a metaphor of the womb, of the mother, the protection, no? And then that's why we designed the space like this. It's a, it's a whale, no? It's inside of a whale. And I think for kids, then they leave home, no? Normally home is a square with your windows. Going in a space, they can imagine. No? They can develop an imagination. They can make an interpretation of the space, no? and using school as an education place, not only to educate it, but also to live the imagination. So I think it's, a, it's one of the rules of architecture. Also, you don't need to be in a school. Now you go to see a beautiful building. It's not only because it's beauty and then you look, it, and what, the, what kind of emotion or what kind of imagination you can imagine something else. No, and I think this is the power of architecture. So, and then it's the kids that enjoy the place. And it's all natural because, you know, kids, small kids, they don't only touch things, but they leak. They're using the tongue to see material. So they want to use all the sense. You know? So you need to design properly, avoid any kind of a contamination. I'll just go quick. I want to show some, some other projects. And that's the ARPA, this headquarters. So for me, it was inspiring by this. And the climate where we had designed and, and, and built this building was hot and humid in the summer and cold and humid in the winter. So there's very bad weather. So the climate is terrible. So what we did is say the roof is not a roof. There are 120 chimney here looking south you know, and working as, a, as environmental strategies. Now the shape of the roof maker in the summertime, increasing the ventilation from the bottom part of the floor. And with stuck effect, we just suck the hot air produced by people, computers and everything. And then increasing us a very slowly ventilation inside of the building, which is even a, a, a nice effect of cooling no? in, the, in your skin. Or in the summertime, in the winter time, using the chimney, as a collecting solar chimney, you know, collecting hot air, and then, you know, this air will circulate in the building. Of course, not enough to make zero, but 30% of cooling less and 40% less of heating is a huge number in terms of energy. And that is done not by technology, but the way you design the building. So what I want to say, is really is in the end of the architects design sustainable building. It's not in the end of technology. Technology can help us a lot, of course. We can make more building, more performance. We can make a better building. But if, if you don't design the building with this relationship, there's no technology, never enough to make a mistake, to cover a mistake. You know? And also people inside the office, you know, they have a very good day lighting. You know? There's all day they like me, I'm very strong, you know, and then what people are looking for. You know, if you're asking what people want when they work in an office space, the first thing is they like me, air quality, and then the space, you know. So, which you mean the two first element is about the comfort, you know, how I'm feeling, I'm feeling good, 
I breathe properly, the air is good, but also the lighting, you know, the be all day the lighting, I think it's showing that people really appreciate the quality of environment. Okay, and uh, okay, the last one, and then I'm stop. I say oh, there's many way to be inspiring, you know, and of course the past, I just show you, and but also nature, you know, plants. I want to say only very quickly, plants are in the planet from 450 million years. So they able to adapt themselves in many, many millions of years. So hominidis is one million, homo sapiens 300,000 years. So we have a gap between us as human today and plants more than 450 million years adaptation. So I'm saying maybe we can look always the future or something in front of us, but I feel that maybe we need to look sometime on the back, sometime on the side. So maybe the plants is in front of you that can tell you a lot of things that we don't know. That's the point. We don't know too many things that are close to us. So this plant and everybody know, no, is a is a sphere, no? which is me when it's under sun, it's not all the time under sun, it's all half is under shade. Then the leaves, they're not flat, it's not flat, it's made like this. No, there are many of these leaves, which is me, they're deep, but also half of the plants is still under shade by the shape of the leaves. Then you see the top is white with micro spine, but it's a lot because it's the point where the sun is much hot. So it reflects the light, avoiding to absorb too much, too much heat. And then the spine around the leaves, of course, is defending from the animals. You know, they, it's a juicy plant, so the people, the, the plant animals want. But because this plant doesn't take water from the ground, we take water from the air. So when temperature change between night and day, on the top of the spine, it will be a drop of water from condensation, and this water go inside of the plant. So how this plant know? How this plant know? How is able to design itself to do that? So how many plants they shape are so intelligent to be able to adapt to extreme climate? How much we can learn from plants? So we designed this campus in Morocco with the idea then inspired by this, which is, this is around buildings with a courtyard. And then the shape outside is made by sort of a spine, but it was flat elements. No? which is make a, a, a that, you know, it's always shading the buildings and shading the window, you know? And these big louvers or vertical louvers are in terracotta, you know? so they're able to absorb and give back the humidity, you know? Which is maybe creating a sort of a microclimate, you know, around the building, and then definitely shading all the time the windows. So I think that's is, that's is, what I told you before, you see the, 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 the pink colors is the hot and the dark is the shadow. You can see the plant is not always under sun. So it's able to, by shape, to adapt to difficult climate. And then the courtyard you know, is green because they, they, maybe the only green we can put is in the courtyard by recycling the gray water. So we can't put plants in the middle of the desert, but we're concentrating in a sort of a, the juicy area, the, the most prestigious and protect area to be. Okay, that's was the and the last one and I'm, I'm stopping is the starting from the beginning, you know, the terra cruda, you know, the mod. Use it for many, many millions of years. That's the only available in the planet. We designed a building with this company called Wasp, which is make 3D printing, and we designed a building printed only by Earth. So, but the point is not the, the printer. Printer is a, is a mechanic thing. It's the way you design. So the shape, the world, how we can make ventilation. And the idea was to give an answer to the main question. 
we able to design zero impact building? Okay, no, but this one is an answer because it's made by Earth digging a hole in the garden and then using a printer. No? So, and the idea is if I'm using mud with no other material, it's come back to the nature. We don't leave any waste and anything, no? and the time is consuming and is back to the original. And it's a very short video, which maybe is no time to see. It's only one minute. So did you see the, the construction things? And, and then that's the final. So what I'm saying, this is maybe not the, the only answer. There's only one step. You know, there a lot of work needs to be done to make this more efficiency and uh, maybe exploring material, which is not only hurt with some other particular attention to their performance on the long term. So. But it's the beginning. You know? I think it, the question was, we can do it. That's maybe not the only answer. I, and that definitely will be not the house for the future. But I'm, what I'm saying is that if you ask me to make something zero energy, zero impact, that is an answer. Maybe not the only one. No? And, and that is the end of the story. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Mario, um, for your talk and presentation, for um, uh, showing us uh, an overview of the book, but also of the exhibition and some of your works. So that was very complete. Thank you. And um, the way this is going to work is I've prepared some questions uh, from the perspective of um, Ground Lab and Landscape Urbanism, the program where I teach um, at the AA. And then we will open the, the questions um, to the audience. Okay. And uh, as Mani was saying, um, if you want to be part of the conversation, please post your questions in the chat. Or if you want to 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 explain your question, then you can raise your hand and they will unmute you. And uh, yeah, so first I'll start saying thanks, uh, Mani and Mario. I, when uh, Manille first approached me, I was a bit surprised because I thought, isn't Mario's work a bit more related to SED's program? But then when when I was reading the book, um, I was surprised because um, these 10 stories, they are threaded by a multiscalarity that uh, bridges many agendas, including um, the work uh, that we are trying to do from a landscape oriented um, perspective and it weaves um, agendas related to the urban and the rural infrastructure services materials communities care 
uh, up to the very material and building details as we saw at the end of, of your presentation. And for me, that builds a, a very interesting perspective to look at uh, the many forms as you were explaining in the introduction of, of understanding sustainability. And maybe I'll start there with a very general question because sometimes I have a bit of trouble or a bit of reluctance to use the word sustainability. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's because um, it's been interpreted in various tricky ways, like it's being co-opted um, eh, by agendas that just seek like profit making and it's this like greenwashing branding. And I was going to ask you, how do you define sustainability? But you've already done it. Uh, uh, so maybe I'll ask you, how do you grapple with this, no? with the greenwashing behind sustainability? Or how do you, um, how do you, like, do you encounter this issue in your practice? Well, uh, uh, yes, I, I agree with you. And uh, I mean, the, the, the problem is we only have one world to say, how we can sustain the planet. No? That uh, is a very large vision of sustainability. And then when, now we're using it as a really a marketing promotion of the same things than we did before, no? only using the world. But I want to see that in a positive way, right? because it's uh, always good to see <laughs> the, the positive side of the story. No? So I'm saying maybe 20 years ago, we never talked about sustainability in buildings or it was a very small number of people. No? Now it's become part of the language. No? The, the developers are also very aggressive. They come to you and say, oh, it must be sustainable in some ways. So I say that thing was not existing maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Now it's a part of the discussion. We are not yet there because, you know, the story is all the same. You say, oh, you know, maybe not today. No, maybe tomorrow, but after tomorrow, we're going to do it. There's the same stories everywhere. When something changes, it's difficult to accept change. You know? But in this case, first, we don't have too many options. And then every single small step to go in this direction is a good news. Mm -hmm. But the point is sometimes which can make me mad because I'm very honest with myself and with my client. Don't ask me something, I can't do it because I can't. I can't make it something that you may be talking zero, zero impact. These things are, are very high ambitions. But from there to arrive, it take a long time. And the most difficult things that I always thinking is, it's not about the climate change. The climate change is something that's going to happen, whatever we want, don't want. But the change of culture is the most important and difficult thing to do because when you, when you, you you're not so, um, when say, it's not easy for people to know things, to change their knowledge. It's very difficult. I'm saying that for university, for teachers, for professionals, if you need to change your knowledge, it requires a huge effort. So that's what the inertia, this was the difficulty, you know, is how we can grow in, in, with the new ideas and new knowledge, how to make building these things. You know, it's in this way. And that's the rule of schools. You know? It's very important. The new generation, they already embedded some ideas of sustainability. At least they're growing with this phenomenon of ecology and planet, save the planet and blah, blah, blah. So maybe it's easy for them because they need to build their knowledge. So that's why we need to help them. We need to help them to, you know, to do that things. But, you know, the architecture is very so large uh, world of uh, between buildings, developers, architects, designers. So it's a huge community. You know? mm -hmm. But I, I think I'm very confident that there will be a day, there will be no more option. Today we still option on the table. No? I'm always say when you say, you know, make a low carbon building, say, okay, you can do it. But you have always have the chance to put your plug in your wall and get electricity, you know? mm -hmm. whether you have photovoltaics or not we still have a chance or option. But maybe I see what's happening in Europe in the moment about scary winters coming and how we can eat in our house. And, and I tell you myself also, I was, I say, oh, maybe we need to change it up. 
we need to think in a different way. Maybe we need to not waste things. You know? and, and I feel more and more, it's not about consumption, it's the way we can avoid waste because we waste too much. We don't need too much, we need less. You know? And maybe this period, which is dramatic for many parts of you, is teaching something us to using what we have in the best way. And that's his approach is coming close to, so, which is mean, doesn't mean we need to suffer or we need to you know, go back in the darkness, but to, to avoid it, to waste energy, waste food, waste material. This is the policy I think is most important. And, and, and uh, you know, I was uh, very exciting when somebody explained me then the, the world sustainability or sustainable comes from music. Because you know? one of the three um, pedals from the piano, you know, you know? there's a piano, when, when is one of these you push and the notes is go longer. So it's a way to sustain the note, which is very poetic, you know. But that is how to make the eat and sustain stuff, our way to do it. So I think we have a learn from music, but uh, we need to learn by ourselves. You know? that, that is. Yeah. Sorry to make too long. No, no, no. No, I think it's, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you that, well, you say that it's going, the moment is going to come, but it has come for some people who this winter won't have the option to switch on the, the kitchen, yeah. for example, in this country or the very use like climate crisis like all around the world so it has come but um it's not affecting like equally uh, yeah, yeah, everybody so maybe when it comes for some people <laughs> then that will be the emergency call yeah and but you know the, the, the pope francis whatever you believe or not doesn't matter he is a politician so. mm -hmm. but he talked about is a financial poverty or economic poverty, but also it's a building poverty. People living in the poor buildings, so they're going to pay the high price of this crisis. Exactly. So again, so I think we need to be take this in consideration on how we can people doesn't suffer or because who is have the, the the high quality life? They always find a way to cover this problem. But I say it's a it's an area of people that can't. Yeah. So they need to care about it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm also like in the next question, I'm going to focus on the chapter about the garden because I, I found a lot of resonance um, there in the points you make with the, um, with the work that we do. And you mentioned like some examples also in the preface um, the, that put into question contemporary distinctions between the urban and the rural. Mm -hmm. Like some of the examples. Uh, predate uh, the enclosures movement um, of the commons and some predate industrialization. But there's, there's you mentioned the, the woodland of Castletown, where you say um, it provides okay. amenity and shelter, but it may have been a source of materials and energy. And you also mentioned the Cadore document um, from the 16th century, where you also say it regulated the management of the forest based on the division of the families living there. It was a form of solidarity, sharing democracy and above all equality. And you also mentioned an even earlier example with the first course of the allegory of the good and, and bad government uh, by Lawrence. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that resonates with the work we do because in our agenda, um, inspired by Neil Brenner, we are constantly trying to question the distinction between the urban and the rural because uh, it's in a way a statistical artifice uh, pro proclaimed by the UN na nations in the in the urban age, no? And I think um, uh, this this idea of uh, the, the distinction between the rural and the urban leads to thinking buildings within its own footprint, and it leads to thinking about sustainable and efficient cities like disregarding the, the landscapes that, that fuel them. And I wanted to, to ask you like how these journeys that you've done through these um, 10 stories, how do they tell us, um, how, do, how do they teach us lessons about the, the relationship between the urban and the rural in the future? Like how, or how do you experience this condition in, in your practice? 
Yes, well, I, I think that especially that there are two interesting stories there. One is in Siena, no? the, the government of the city said the good government is because it's a good uh, landscape and countryside, no? because, which is mean the life of a city depending with the countryside and the production thing, which is a bad government doesn't exist if the countryside is not good. So I think that's what's showing the link. But it's not too different than today. Well, today we have industry, which it was not at that time. But I, I feel more and more, the, I, I'm in Bologna now, and in the city is, you know, it's not too big. It's only half a million cities. And, uh, and then countryside is coming very deep inside of a city, and also field coming very close. But what's happening around, then more and more people start to uh, planting their own vegetable garden. You know? This phenomenon is huge you know? here in Milan. Is, uh, but the reason why this happened is uh, because people want to back to have this relation with nature. But also, I was, they tell me the story. It was, a, it was very funny. It's a young couple in Milan. You know? they renting this 50 square meter to make their vegetable garden. You know? And they take the bicycle and they go to the south of Milan and then growing carrots and all those things. And, but they say, why you don't buy your food? You know, it's cheaper, no? I say, well, it's not about only the food, because when we there, our neighborhood have a beautiful carrots better than us. And I ask him why, how you made it, no? And then, then start to be not about only the food, but how people get gathering together. So I, I think this, we must not miss the point that it's not only about growing vegetables, but people need this kind of relationship. And sometimes cities instead to make people together, they make people not close each other, no anonymities and people doesn't say hello on the street. So I think people, human need that, you know, and that's why these things happen. And also, there are more and more debate also in Italy, there are some difficulties, how to make a city farm for food, no? to improving, closing, avoiding traffic. So, so I, I think the story is coming from so far. So from the medieval time, this kind of a good relation with the countryside to make a better city or better citizen. So I feel it's only change the dimension, but the problem is still there. And I'm not sure we saw me, but you see what happened in New York or many urban contexts and people need looking for, uh -huh. for plants, close them, no? they need to occupy. Also, the moment that you take care is another point, you know? take care about things. You know? In a world where we don't take care about anything because we buy everything, it's a phenomenal psychologically, it's amazing. Take care of your garden. I, I, I engage myself to do something good. You know? I think people are looking for that you know? and, and they want to do it. You know? And I feel more and more these things is up around us. But we find when we did the Italian pavilion in Biennale about the, the internal area of the Italy, so not to talk about the cities, but the most villages, we find in the north, close to Austria, the, there's a community of um, immigrants. They take care about the land, take care about the old people. So it's sort of an integration between immigrants and uh, refugees and population. But then they find a document was drawn in the medieval time about how the family of this community divide their wood from the forest. Mm -hmm. And the point was that not one, there was a turning every year, you know, the first family get the best cut, and then the second one have the middle cut, and then third and then that. Then the last one next year, they get the best cut. So it was a very democratic way to, to sharing resource, you know, mm -hmm. and I find that so, it's so modern, it's so contemporary, you know, how we yeah. can help families or communities you not know, to share in the best and uh, sort of a rotation. So I think this kind of problems is embedded in humankind. So I think we, a different form, a different shape, but I think substantially the same. You know? and, uh, uh -huh. Yeah, that's something. Then uh, or now then some like a sustainability people say, oh, we can make a garden in the roof. So, yes, we can make a garden on the roof. We can make some... Vegetable. My office in Milan, I have a roof 
Uh, we planting tomatoes and uh, pepperoni, apples, pear, and grapes. But I'm say I'm lucky to do it. It's uh, not possible to do everywhere. But uh, I think this uh, this this uh, kind of an argument it become more and more in the common discussion, you know? and that's I think uh, creating a very high hope. Uh-huh. It's doing good. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's part. Of, it's more and more part of the discussion. Yeah. I think like there are some think tanks here, like promoting like food as a form of building community, as you were saying. No, as mm. you care, you care for the soil, you care for the water, you care for for the community as well. But at the same time, we live in a globalized farm. No, yeah. like we are shipping fertilizers from yeah, China yeah. to fertilized soya in Brazil that's going to be fed to. Uh, chicken in the UK, like the whole scale of the farm is sheer madness at the moment. So, but then, yeah, there the are conversations starting, but never at the level of the policy yeah, and the regulation. No? Yeah, it's working maybe in a small scale, but in big exactly. scale. Yeah. But I, I was talked to Professor Mancuso, the guy who's a neurobiologist of plants. He said, uh-huh. 80% of the forests are cut to make uh, agriculture. Uh-huh. which is feeding animals for protein. So the 80% of forests are cut to provide the 20% of, um, what to say, to producing meat for uh, what, what's, uh, what, what protein. No. Uh-huh. So yeah. it's absolutely a crazy relationship. 80% of land to produce food for cows, then provide only 20% of protein when protein are in many many plants uh-huh. so it's crazy it's something crazy and then of that 20 percent of protein 30 percent is wasted yeah so it's an absolutely unsustainable system yes, yes. i've been in new zealand uh, this summer or uh-huh. winter and then i saw the map how many forests they cut it no to make cow uh, farm because the Chinese now, they don't want any more land, they want uh, veal. And so they cut the forest to make a farm with the cow for milk and for meat, and then reducing in an in incredible way the capacity of that country to maintain the equilibrium in so difficult context. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And providing this kind of a relief, which is, <laughs> is losing for everybody. So it's, yeah. Anyway. I think this um I think this leads into my next question because I think it's also a question of uh, awareness. Mm-hmm. And I think this is why it's so important to tell the stories that you mentioned, yeah. no? like the narratives, like what is behind the stories about sustainability. No, it's not like this banal idea of the eco branding, yeah. but it's more about getting to know more about the the labor behind um, our buildings, the labor, the materials behind uh, our buildings, the landscapes behind, like the larger footprint that you mentioned. No? And in your in your book, you say something like um, the biography of materials and energy. I wanted to know... Um, Sorry, biography? I'm missing something there. Uh, you talk about a biography of materials and energy. As an alternative to understanding like buildings in a larger footprint, I would like to know if you have had like any experience in your practice where you've uh, developed this idea a bit further or uh, if you want to talk a bit more about it. Yes, we we did a work actually last uh, April for uh, last June for the Salone in Uh Milan. And because they asked me to make an exhibition about sustainability and I realized, well, I can't do it like this. I say, in which kind of a, which kind of a theme we're going to want to express on the, and then we did using material. We're not, um, material, they are not made by oil, but only by nature. Mm-hmm. So and we find amazing stuff, but maybe you know, and then all know, but. I was discovering that is a is a French company. They using this the squail of a fish, uh-huh. called the skin of the fish. You know, uh-huh. they, they, and okay. yeah, they using this is a waste. You know? They collecting this and they make panels because the cellulose inside of this material uh-huh. is a billions of tons of this, you know? uh-huh. and then they make beautiful panels. So the, the circle is is a uh, 
it's possible to make a material without be part of the oil industry. Mm-hmm. And also, there's a, there's a company we're using now for some uh, product, for some project. They're using the roots of mushroom, you know, the uh, micellio, no? uh-huh. and, and then you can make with this uh, phot- um, phono acoustic panels. No? Mm-hmm. And then the company they made is a, is a mushroom company. They're just cutting mushroom and they're using the micellio and they're transforming in panels. And then and then they have a very good characteristic also for fire protection. So it's amazing. If you're going to look at that, you can find a, a world that they're already moving to a new ideas of material. Mm-hmm. Quite interesting. Of course, it's a little bit different aesthetic of uh, aluminum panels or mm-hmm. the perfection of some uh, tiles or that things. But I, I think this is the way we can make a, a new aesthetic by material, they contain it, this idea of, of uh, be in a circle. No? They mm-hmm. use waste or they're using something they're not, not using oil anymore. So I think there's a, we did a biography, bibliography and we made an ex- exhibition to explain this. Uh-huh. I was uh, very impressed about the people Cool. People go to Salone to see you know, furniture. You know, they don't have time for an exhibition. Mm-hmm. And I was really impressed by how many people mm-hmm. they was reading documents about this possible to do in a different way, mm-hmm. which is mean they're creating a sort of a, of a you need to like tell stories about material. No? Maybe yeah. next book is then story about new material not dependent to oil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I still have a couple more questions, but maybe uh, I'll open to the audience first, so I don't. <laughs> uh, I don't. Uh, There's a question in the chat. Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Um, there's one about um, about sustainability in the career of architecture in the in the in a university in Buenos Aires. Ah, yes. Yeah. And they are trying to show uh, the difference between their this is in Italian ambientare progetti dan progettare ambientale ambientalmente. Uh, I'm looking there. Uh, yeah, I, I'm 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 love Buenos Aires. I'm telling to Vicenta. I'm, I'm a very. Uh, I'm going to say a love story with the city because I, I was supposed to be there in the end of of uh, September for the Biennale. It was uh, I did a, a speech online and then I always I always love to be there. There's so nice people and it's great school also. And I really the the Yes, I, I will I will send you an answer about your question. Okay. <laughs> She writes me something that is yes, in Italian. Okay. 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 Thank you. And uh, Misaki Nisho was asking also if this way of making architecture can be shared widely, widely beyond competitive creativity of architects. Like perhaps if I could add, like if it can become like common practice, I guess. It has to do with how it goes into the um, into the norms and um, yeah. in regulations, no? Yeah. Well, I say as we said before, there be not too many options in the future. So, as uh, you know, the example maybe looks a bit uh, strange, but we all embedded in our design the fire regulation. No, is embedded. Now you can't design without. Uh, uh, fire protection plan, all you know, all the rules. No, so it will not be not too difficult to think that will be sustainable rules as a part of your building code. Then you can really need to reach that and be part of the process. I mean, I, I'm saying should be looking that not uh, exceptional work. You need to be work as a normal work, as as the practice. So before we did. Uh, we concentrating in performance with machine, and maybe the next generation building is concentrating on performance with environment. But it's part of the normal process. Of course, the problem is there will be no regulation tell you how to design a building. 
there's no regulation. A regulation maybe tell you the distance between the doors and the, for security and uh, maybe lighting, artificial light uh, numbers uh, to considering uh, safe uh, numbers of blocks, but they never tell you how to design the buildings. So I think there are two things. One is make more rules in buildings than, than uh, related to sustainability. It's something we have already, you know, like uh, the new regulation to have a passive house or there's a regulation about the kilowatts you can, uh, the, the class a, a, the energy class of building like A, B, C, D. So, but normally that class of, of, uh, of uh, buildings are mainly related to the equipment. Uh, you have efficiency machine, then you'll be there. They don't really mix the passive and active uh, strategies. So maybe, so you have a problem of tools and, and uh, verification, certification is complicated. But maybe in the, in the near future, we need to be more, uh, more uh, engaged on how you design the buildings. Of course, it's a, it's a strong relation with the engineer, you know? but I like the idea that architects, they have a little bit of knowledge about physics, you know, how buildings work. Yeah? because they're creating a good dialogue with the engineer. Today, sometimes, I don't want to simplify, but sometimes architects design whatever they want, and then engineer try to save what is possible to save. It's not really a strong relationship. You know? So because engineering, they don't know nothing about architecture, and architects, they don't know too much about the engineering. And well, engineering for me is physics. No? Uh -huh. So if, if these two knowledge are a little bit overlapping, they can help a lot, no? because you can suggest a solution they don't need technical agreement. And the engineer that help you to make this balance. No? It's a lot of work need to be done, but I'm very confident because 2030 is tomorrow. I mean, the student at AAA now, when they be 2030, they will be already on, on major work. They already fashion. So I think yeah, I always say they have a higher responsibility. We have, but they have too. So they need to find uh, with the uh, training, you know, solutions and attitude in relation of of this um, of this agenda. I mean, agenda very very ambitious, but uh, yeah. this, we did already. We, you know, I'm not scared. I'm not worried that we cannot reach. Mm -hmm. The problem with architects is not only the problem with the science. <laughs> Yeah, yes. I think there's a, there are some leading student voices in AA Action which are doing like uh, some interesting things at the AA. So there's hope on that side. Yeah, but AA was always, uh, no, uh, how can I say? I mean, in time, in the history, you know, was always advanced, always find something that will never happen before. So I, I think this kind of a mm -hmm. DNA, you know, to, to be always one step forward is uh, mm -hmm. if they did in, if we're going to do it in environment or all these kind of things, they will be promoting a lot because the network is very large and mm -hmm. you know, need, need to be more sexy, you know? Yeah. Because a long time buildings, a sustainable building are not looking very good, you know? It's, uh, mm -hmm. So we need to find some. Mm. So I, I think also in relationship to the, from the exception to the, to the norm, if I can extend like two, three minutes more of, of take two, three minutes more of your time. Yeah. I, I really resonate with this sentence that you say that the landscape, that you define landscape as the decorative frill around the skirt of a building. And I really resonate, um, that really resonates with my critique of the profession. And I would really expand it to architecture because um, it's become like they say, we provide a, a, the final embellishment touches of a much larger like decision-making process that involves uh, planning at larger scales, the economics, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's, um, there's a very nice slide from Finn Williams that showed in a lecture at the AA where he was representing all the steps up to the construction of a building in London. And you could see that the architect was really playing the role in the very, very final stages. So there's this embellishment um, aspect. In, and I think the, like from this idea of the exception to the norm, 
what do you think about the, the role of architects in the public bodies? in the administration, like making part of writing um, those like the like the fire um, rules and, and regulations? Or do you think that are there other forms in which design practice practices can be more relevant in this like very much needed change? Well, I don't know how much access can be relevant in the public because depending where, you know, yeah. Italy is, or my it's like a, a extinguished animals you know, they, they, nobody cares too much you know? mm-hmm. and then it's a strange because you know what's happened when covid coming and then you know everybody was told no covid creating problems and then we see our city desert there was nobody around the buildings uh, empty so, and then i don't know in england but in italy it was a lot of questions to architects. Oh, wow, how you can see the city of tomorrow uh-huh. and how you can design the house for the future. So in a crisis moment, in so difficult moment, the question was not only about how we can save people. That's, of course, was part of the fundamental. But the major question was to talk to architects how they see the future. No? And I find myself a little bit laughing to say, well, you never talk with the architects, I say the press or the of the, you know, the state and the government, but they don't really care about the architects. They think in its architects, no, there are too many, no? But then when there was a moment to define what will be the future of the city, they're not calling a political person. They politicians, they don't know anything about it. They start to call architects. They start to ask designers what, what should be the bed of the future, no? or what would be the place for working. So, I mean, I think we need more and more good architects because they they can have a vision of the future because we work for the future, no? because we design buildings for tomorrow, not for, for the next time. But I, I feel more and more, to, especially in a more... Uh, the more um, commercial area or more developers or it's more speculative, then there is a part of our work that we start to be organized by the others. You know? I find architects, they are calling to give a touch, you know, to give a, some personality, but they don't care about the process. The process is coming more and more in the end of other people you know, and make a decision, see this. You know? and, and I think that's is worrying me a lot because if you got in the end, you can solve it maybe a small part of the problem or maybe not. So I, I and I don't know. I, I feel it's almost everywhere like this. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I don't know everywhere, but I'm seeing America. It's, it's coming crazy. Developers they organize themselves. They call architects inside. They decide. They, they, I was talking with some client. It's a very large developer. So, oh, we don't need any more engineering. You know, we know how to do things and we do ourselves. You know? And I said, well, what about architects? Well, we need because, you know, it's uh, artistic things and it's also, you know, you, know, you can make different. An architect can make, it, can make a project in a different way. Mm-hmm. But, but they do it. They call you because they need it, but only for one part of the story, you know, which is make me feeling that if we are not very well organized about these things of sustainability and we don't increase our knowledge, the risk is to be always in a small part of the process. And as we know how the complex is the process, no way to come in the end. In the end decision is made and you only maybe painting or decide the color of the tiles mm-hmm. or maybe shape in the roof but that's not i'm not interested about that so mm-hmm. so it's a moment of change you know it's an uh, architect need to be more united not not to be against mm-hmm. but to sell him better the knowledge that's mm-hmm. the only thing we can do yeah yeah and pro- like in this series, the stories about sustainability is very much about that. Yeah. Like <laughs> Good. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I think there are no more questions. Uh, just a reminder from Aniji that the book is available at the bookshop. I strongly recommend it. It's yeah. really nice to read like the size, the, even the font. It's a very nice book. Thank you very much. Great.
Thank you both so much. It was such an interesting conversation. Thank you, Mary Jane. Thank you very much. And definitely go see the exhibition if you're in London in the AA Gallery. Fantastic promotion. Thank you. Thank you, Maria and Clara. I'm gonna I'll just try and unmute everybody so you can get a small round of applause. <laughs>